Welcome all. It's a lot of fun for me to be here with you this evening. Um, my fellow David Bowie fans, <laughs> as we talk about the early career of David Bowie. Um, I'm Professor Amanda Eubanks Winkler, and I teach in the Department of Art and Music Histories in the College of Arts and Sciences. And right now I am chair of the Department of Art and Music Histories, and um, I also teach music history and cultures classes. And so you're gonna get a little sense of kind of some of the music history and cultures classes that you could take in my department. Um, and uh, I do teach a class on David Bowie. So this is a compilation of some of the things that I do with my students there. So many of you probably know something about David Bowie. Um, this guy, right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, his different characters that he's played over time. You have Major Tom, Ziggy Stardust, Aladdin Sane, um, Thomas Newton, because he's an actor as well, right? In The Man Who Fell to Earth, Thin White Duke, and Pierrot, um, which shows up on Scary Monsters and Super Freaks. So um, we're going to talk about his early days and some of the influences that he had that helped him then be creating some of these iconic characters and personas that you see before you. Um, so let's go back to the beginning, shall we? This is little David Jones. He was not born David Bowie. That was a stage name. And he was born in South London um, in a place called Brixton. And this was right after World War II in Britain. Uh, and his mom uh, was a, a theater usher. She worked at a movie theater. And his dad worked for a children's charity. He was sort of lower middle class, I suppose, if we're using American terminology. Middle class means something a little bit different in Britain, but um, he was sort of lower middle class. And his family then eventually moved out to the suburbs. And so he grew up in this suburban life, <laughs> which he didn't really enjoy, truth be told. Um, he gravitated towards music and dance and art from quite an early age, and his talent was spotted from quite an early age. He ended up going to art school where he, um, he one of his teachers was Peter Frampton, the guitarist's dad. Um, so a lot of times with Bowie, he hooks up with people early in his life, and then some of them, as we'll see, were important presences for him throughout his career. Um, and of course, he did later work with Peter Frampton, the guitarist, and collaborated with him. So he had a robust education in art. Um, he also um, took uh, uh, saxophone lessons. So he's a saxophone player. He got really interested in jazz via his brother, Terry, um, with whom he was quite close. And um, through being exposed to jazz with his brother, he decided that he was going to study saxophone. So he did that as a kid as well. And in fact, on some of his albums, he does play saxophone. By his own admission, he's not a great saxophone player, but he does have that in his toolkit. One of the things from very, very early on with David Bowie and that becomes a through thread throughout his career till the very end is this playing around with gender. Um, and he was really engaging with androgyny from very early on. And you've got to understand in the 1960s, gender roles were extremely rigid. And so when the Beatles, for example, came to the United States, um, they were really questioned about the length of their hair, their masculinity was called into question and their sexuality. And certainly this is something that also um, young Davy Jones was experiencing. So I'm gonna play a little clip for you. This is Davy Jones before he's David Bowie, 17-year-old Davy Jones, uh, on this show called The Night Tonight, um, and it was a British show. And basically, at this point in his life, Davy Jones was trying to get famous by any means he could. And so being on this show was part of his thing. It's like, I'm going to be a famous guy. I'm going to do this, right? Um, and so that was part of his thing and he wanted to do anything to get exposure. So this was a little bit of him being opportunistic, but it also, as we see later, because it was such a through thread throughout his career, it was something that he was really interested in um, as an artist and as a person, was playing around with gender. 
So this is young Davy Jones. You get the idea. <laughs> so this goes on for some time. But I wanted to play this just to show that from very early on, this was something that he was engaging with. Another thing that you might not know about David Bowie is that he was really a music theater nerd. <laughs> so it, when he was uh, kind of in the late 60s, he was not only in a bunch of different rock bands as he was trying to kind of make a go of it and figure that out, um, but he was also listening to a lot of music theater and cabaret. And one of the guys that he was really infatuated by was this guy, Anthony Newley. Now, you may not have heard him. He's probably more famous in England than he is in the United States. But he did write some very famous uh, musicals like Stop the World, I Want to Get Off. And if you know him, you might know him from the Gene Wilder version of Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory because he wrote uh, the score to that. Um, but in the late 60s, he had a series of musical theater successes, and young David Bowie was definitely listening. In fact, by David Bowie's own admission, a lot of his vocal style is taken from this guy. So I'm going to go ahead and play a little bit of a clip of Anthony Newley so you can hear what it sounds like. And if you know what David Bowie sounds like, I'm sure you're going to hear some similarities. So young Bowie was soaking some of this up like a sponge. He's like, ooh, I want to take some of that vocal styling, this kind of uh, particular vibrato. And also the fact, and this is very important for Britain in this particular moment in time, Anthony Newley is using a London accent and a London lower class accent. At the time in Britain, um, if you were a performer or a broadcaster, oftentimes you were forced to take elocution lessons. So you would do RP, received pronunciation. So if you watch The Crown, it's like <laughs> the way that the Queen speaks, right? A very, very precise and it would must do this, you know, that sort of thing. He's using a lower class London accent, and that was Bowie's state of accent. And so Bowie also tends to use that sort of accent when he sings. And this was something that the Beatles really broke through because they were using their native Liverpudlian accents, this working class Liverpudlian accent. Um, so they were kind of breaking through this class divide. And Anthony Newley is kind of playing around with that here as well. After all right, so how did this influence Baby Bowie? <laughs> well, I will show you. So he kept trying and trying and trying all these different things. When none of his rock groups worked out, he, he kind of was thinking about maybe being a cabaret performer of some time and his uh, of some kind. And his uh, person that he was working with, who was his agent, was this guy by the name of Ken Pitt. And Ken Pitt was sort of packaging him as a cabaret performer. So as part of that, they made kind of a sample film reel um, that was filming little music videos of things that appeared mostly on his early album just called David Bowie, which was a massive flop. Um, I'm gonna play a cut from one of, from this early album that was also turned into this music video. It's called Rubber Band. Um, this is, a music hall song. Uh, and what do I mean by that? Well, in Britain, uh, what they call vaudeville is music hall. And so it's like the vaudeville of, of Great Britain. And these kinds of songs show up on a lot of 60s rock albums. So think When I'm 64 by the Beatles. That's, that's kind of a music hall sound. It's referring back to older popular music styles. And you can hear this in terms of the arrangement. You've got trumpo, oboe, and tuba. You do not have electric guitars. Um, it's a character song. That means that Bowie is adopting another, a, a persona, another person. So again, this is something that becomes quite important for him later on. So here he's playing a guy who uh, fought in World War I and comes back from war and his lover has rejected him. That's the kind of conceit of the song. Um, Bowie always had a really keen sense of humor and was sort of tongue in cheek about a lot of what he did. And so the PR release for this single says it's pathos set to tubas <laughs> and it kind of is an apt description. So let's go ahead and look at a little tiny bit of this rubber band.
Now, as you might imagine, this album and this song was not a big hit for David Bowie. Um, he just kept writing in this idiom, though. He didn't want to give it up. And, uh, and it, because it was really something that appealed to him um, in the late 60s. So he, again, he was still casting about trying to find his way and trying to find what he was going to do. But some of these experiments like rubber band, this idea I'm taking on a character, I'm not being myself, that becomes important for his procedure later. Um, and, and also the vocal style um, that's really derived from some of what Anthony Newley was doing. In fact, when his early albums were reviewed, um, a lot of the reviewers said, what is this Anthony Newley pastiche? What is this guy doing? Because he sounded in, on some of the tracks so similar to Anthony Newley. This person was another huge influence on David Bowie in his early years, and it threaded all the way through because even to the very kind of the latter part of Bowie's career, say in the 90s, he was really engaged with movement and dance in his performance because he had dance training, and in part, he studied dance with this guy, Lindsay Kemp. So Lindsay Kemp... Um, He'd studied dance with Hilda Holger and also the mime Marcel Marceau. If you know anything about mime or like even just Google mime online, you probably will pull up an image of Marcel Marceau, this French mime. Um, as you can see, he was kicking around London in the 1960s, had his own dance company, and he actually met Bowie backstage in 1967. Bowie came to one of his performances and was intrigued and then Bowie started studying dance and mime with him and also became his lover. So they were very close collaborators for a little period of time in the late 60s. So um, as you can see, <laughs> mime and, and dressing up in these ways was something that engaged Bowie throughout his career. Again, this is uh, the Pierrot costume uh, that was on the cover of a Scary Monsters album in 1980. So one of the things that feeds into mime that also is a big influence on Bowie and his process, both in terms of makeup and other things he does, um, is Commedia dell'arte. So Commedia dell'arte was an improvised style of theater. It dates back to the Renaissance. Um, and it has stock characters like Pierrot, Columbine. And these characters have certain things associated with them. So like Pierrot is a sad clown. Columbine is a love interest who you never kind of get um, Harlequin is another kind of Commedia dell'arte character. And so Kemp was in, engaged with this kind of Commedia dell'arte style stuff. He was teaching Bowie and they collaborated on this theater piece called Piro in Turquoise, which was broadcast on television in the late 60s. The late 60s was a strange and wonderful time. <laughs> um, and so I'm going to play a little clip of this. Bowie wrote the songs and he plays the character of Cloud in this theater piece. And then Lindsay Kemp is playing the role of Piro um, in this particular piece. All right, and that's Columbine doing a little dance number. Um, so again, these things that do not usually inform rock star performance are informing Bowie. So we have the gender play, which was a part of rock star performance, honestly. Um, but Commedia dell'arte, not so much. <laughs> um, playing characters. Um, this was something that had started in the 60s, for sure. Um, this idea of like not being yourself in performance. That's what was behind the Sgt. Pepper album, right? They didn't want to be the Beatles anymore, so we're going to be Sgt. Pepper. But Bowie really does end up taking all of this to a different level. All right. So his first character <laughs> that really breaks through and does something for him is Major Tom. Now this Major Tom character was introduced on the track Space Oddity, which was his first hit after all of these years, I and mean, it was years for him, kind of wandering in the wilderness, not having this commercial success, he finally gets a top five single in the UK with Space Oddity. And it's because he was hitting at the right time. This was 1969. So not only was Stanley Kubrick's uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey, which was one of Bowie's big films he loved, um, not only was that really popular, but 
1969, astronauts went to the moon. And so this was really a novelty song. It was considered at the time to be a novelty song. It was not this rock classic. It's like, oh, this is this quirky little novelty song by this quirky guy who's, who's writing this. Um, but this character ended up being a pretty profound alter ego for, for Bowie and it recurs again and again. It's mentioned in the song Ashes for Ashes from 1980 where he says, you know, Major Tom's a junkie. Um, because of course it's referring to Bowie himself who did have lots of substance abuse problems. Hello Space Boy from much later in his career. And in the video, um, one of his last videos, Black Star, you see an astronaut with like a skull inside, like a, someone's died and there's an astronaut there. And you know, there's speculation that's Major Tom. Um, this song did also get critical support, which had really not been coming to Bowie with all of his cabaret and uh, music theater-esque activities. Um, he got a special songwriting award for originality for this one. Now, there's many different versions of this song. There's actually three different versions that were recorded around the same time. The one I'm going to play for you here was the one that was included on Love You Till Tuesday. Again, this is this concept film that they put together when they were trying to sell Bowie as this kind of multimedia performer. Um, and this is the first video for Space Oddity. And it's not cool rock star Bowie, it's Bowie playing characters. So he's like, okay, I'm gonna be the ground control guy and then I'm gonna play Major Tom. So he's taking on several different roles. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and just play a little bit of it so you can see this early incarnation of this song. All right, um, so again, he finally broke through with this, but it's another stylistic change, right? So instead of doing the cabaret musical theater stuff um, or some of the early rock stuff that I didn't have a chance to get into because we just don't have enough time, he's going into the folk rock direction here and he's having some success with this, some commercial success. Unfortunately for Bowie, this was a one hit <laughs> and he went right back to not getting attention and right back to not having success. Um, however, around this period, he hooked up with somebody that was going to be a long-standing collaborator for him, and that's Tony Visconti, who worked with him starting in 1968 and then really to the end of his life in 2016. Um, he didn't work on every single album, but he was a fairly constant presence in Bowie's life. Now, Bowie, he was an autodidact. That is, he meant he, he taught himself a lot of things. He was really intellectually curious. Um, and so when he started doing songwriting, he's like, I need to learn music theory. So he checked out a book from the library and he tried to figure out music theory so he could be a better songwriter. And he also was interested in orchestration because he wanted to have different kinds of instruments and a different palette um, in his arrangements. However, he was not classically trained. And so Tony Visconti um, filled in some gaps for him. Um, he had classical training, so he could write score arrangements if they were bringing in orchestral musicians to play in the studio. And he was a very proficient popular musician as well. So then he had this collaborator who then could help him execute um, some of what he wanted to do with his songwriting. The album that they worked on together, um, the first kind of larger scale project, was The Man Who Sold the World. Um, and interestingly, here you can see the difference in the American LP cover and the UK LP cover. In the UK LP cover, we have Bowie gender bending again um, and wearing a dress. Um, and in the American LP, um, the American company Mercury said, we can't have you in a dress on the cover. American audiences will not accept this. And so they had an alternate cover for America. And you can see the cowboy with the disintegrating cowboy hat. Behind the cowboy is a building. And right around this time, um, remember I mentioned Bowie's brother, Terry, and how important Terry was to him? Well, Terry suffered from schizophrenia 
and had been admitted to the mental hospital. And Bowie was extremely upset by this and fell into a depression. So this album is threaded through with themes of alienation and also mental illness. And this definitely becomes a theme in Bowie's work. He was worried, especially during this period in his 20s, that he too was going to succumb to mental illness. Um, and he did struggle with, with mental illness actually during this period. Um, so he was quite depressed when he made this album. Um, you hear him pivoting again into another style. He's heading in a harder rock direction on this album. Um, and Mick Ronson, who is gonna be a collaborator with him also on some later work, um, particularly Ziggy Stardust, um, he's giving it this harder edge sound along with um, Visconti's chops with producing on this album are evident as well. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and play the title track or a little bit of the title track. Um, this song is really about alienation. Um, it's about doubles um, and meeting yourself almost um, and coming face to face because Bowie is in fact, in a way, the man who sold the world. He's selling himself as a product, right? Um, but what is he giving up in order to do that? Um, that's the question. So there's this theme of alienation that threads through this song and we can hear it's got an ominous quality. There's this very famous electric guitar riff that it starts off with. And then when the verse comes in, his voice is distorted, um, which gives it to the listener this alienating effect. And there's also kind of an unsettling combination of um, uh, uh, percussion as well. And then didn't start it quite yet, um, but you could hear that riff, right? Uh, some of you might know this track, you might not know the David Bowie original of this track, but you might know it in its Nirvana incarnation because Nirvana did a quite famous cover. I'm just going to play through the A and the B and the C sections, and I'm going to call out when we get to each thing so you're kind of oriented in your listening. So let's start this from the beginning again, and you'll hear the riff first. And you can hear a little bit of that newlyism, like still remaining, even this totally different kind of face to face, you know, there's still that kind of accent going on there. Um, so uh, you can hear how he's playing around with these themes and these themes again, that would definitely be threaded through to the very end of his career. So we're gonna leave it with this album. Um, this is the last album that I'm gonna talk about um, from his early period. And this is really the album that's gonna set him up for success. Um, it was not initially kind of a really big hit. It didn't generate a lot of energy. But after he hit with Ziggy Stardust, which was after this, um, people went back to Hunky Dory. And some of the tracks on here like Changes, um, Life on Mars, they became these big uh, songs for him and became very much associated with him. It is a great album. It's actually probably one of my favorite Bowie albums. It's, it's still got some of that early quirk <laughs> that you find on his albums where he's just doing really odd and off-center things. Um, but it's also got just some really primo songwriting on this. Um, so the cover, again, gender bending, kind of playing with androgyny, gender fluidity. Uh, this is him uh, imitating a famous uh, actress from the early 20th century, Marlene Dietrich, who was one of his idols. Bowie was really infatuated by early 20th century Germany and particularly the Weimar Republic. This is the period before Hitler took power. And he really was into that period because it was a really fertile period for art and music and drama in the early 20th century. And so he constantly kept going back to that well. It was really a big influence for him. So this is him calling out one of his screen idols that he loves on the cover. Um, you can see the personnel there. Um, Rick Wakeman plays piano on some of the tracks, whereas Bowie says, I'm not good enough to play on this track. Let's get Rick Wakeman in, who is a really proficient piano player. Prog rock guy. Um, and then Rick McRonson was back for this one. And then Woody Woodmancy on drums and Trevor Boulder on bass and trumpet. 
So just to show you the comparison, he obviously had seen this portrait and was imitating it himself. And you can see also that Marlene Dietrich in her day was interested in androgyny. She frequently would dress in men's clothing. All right. Um, on this album was another infatuation. So I remember I said Bowie was an autodidact. That means he loved to read and he loved to read about philosophy and occultism and all these things. So one of the things that's really present on this album is he became really infatuated by Friedrich Nietzsche. He was not alone. This was like a 60s counterculture thing. He and many people in that time were infatuated by Nietzsche and the idea, especially of this Übermensch. Um, you may be familiar with some of these Nietzschean concepts if you, because some of this stuff was co-opted by Nazis and terrible people, but Nietzsche in his own time, you know, he, saw, he died in 1900 and he was actually opposed to anti-Semitism and nationalism. So it was really his work being misused by others. Um, you'll see some of the things that uh, Nietzsche here was interested in and that played into some of the lyrics on this album. Um, you know, Bowie was really under the sway of Nietzsche um, and uh, was really interested in him. He was also really interested in the occult um, and Aleister Crawley. And this was another kind of common countercultural thing in the late 60s to be into Aleister Crawley. Crawley shows up on the cover of Sgt. Pepper. The Beatles thought he was cool too. <laughs> you can see Bowie essentially cosplaying as Aleister Crawley there. Like, you know, he's got on his, um, because Aleister Crawley would dress in Egyptian garb for some reason. He founded his own religion um, and uh, he was this member of this hermetic order of the Golden Dawn. They were all interested in alchemy and ceremonial magic. And um, so Bowie was really into this because Bowie was always a spiritual seeker. In the late 60s, for a while, he thought about becoming a Tibetan monk. Um, he was into this for a while. And then later on in his career, he became interested in Christianity. So you know, he, he was always, he was a seeker. He was always kind of looking for something. Um, so these things are all threaded through this album and you can hear elements of um, Aleister Crawley, Nietzsche, and also various other sci-fi things he's throwing in here because he loved sci-fi. Um, this song, Oh You Pretty Things, shows up on uh, Hunky Dory. It is a really odd song. Bowie composed it on the piano um, and I've played it through and it is, it's actually really difficult to play just because it goes to strange places under your figure, fingers and it's, in, it's D flat. <laughs> so it's a weird key with lots of accidentals to play. It has 15 different chords in a three minute song. That is a level of harmonic complexity that you don't often find um, in, in popular music. Um, so he's really doing some, some unusual things with his harmonies here. Um, and then uh, as you can see, he's also got a lot of metrical displacement, like the rhythms aren't doing what you expect. He's shifting meters. Um, and that's also somewhat unusual, although there are bands in the 60s that do more of that, but it certainly is, really, really complicated harmonically. Um, so anyway, I'm gonna just play a little bit of this so you can hear what I'm talking about. And he'll also hear him talk about, you've got to make way for the homo superior. That's like a little wink to Nietzsche's <laughs> Übermensch, right? The Superman, the overman who will transcend. Um, okay. Um, so again, you can hear that kind of <clears throat> unsettled harmonic palette here. You don't know where it's going to land. It's, it's going everywhere. So it's, it's a really masterful song, but it's a really unusual pop song. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's, and, and it's unusual in terms of its lyrics too, because of what it's, it's drawing upon. Um, so the last song that I'm going to leave you with is a song that is really a strongly associated with Bowie. It was associated with him throughout his career and it brings together the sci-fi stuff. It brings together um, the idea of he's talking about someone who isn't him, in this case, a girl who's hooked to the silver screen. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's kind of drawing on older styles of popular music. 
um, lots of orchestral lushness in this one, but also is, uh, is uh, bringing something fresh and new. And that's the song Life on Mars. What you might not know is this song is derived from an older popular song. Bowie would often do this. He's, he'd use something else as a template for his, uh, for his work. And so he said, he said, look, you know, um, I, I, he, at one point he was commissioned to do a translation of this French song. And I'm just gonna, because he was working as kind of a journeyman songwriter. Um, and his publisher had approached him and said, hey, um, I want you to do a translation of this French song called Comme d'habitude. So I'm gonna play a little bit of this song and it probably is familiar to you. So Bowie then did a translation of this song and sent it to his publisher because his publisher said, hey, Frank Sinatra wants to do this song and you know, could you do a translation? Well, Sinatra didn't like it and he got this other guy, Paul Anka to do it instead. And this is the song it became. So Bowie, he admits that his lyric, even a fool, which I won't play for you, but it's really bad. <laughs> he admits it wasn't good, but it kind of stuck in his craw that Sinatra didn't pick him. So when he was thinking about writing the song Life on Mars, he actually used the chord progressions from the beginning of My Way um, as the underpinning of this song or as a point of departure. And he later would use the same procedure on the song Starman because he used um, Somewhere Over the Rainbow for that one. So he was constantly going back to this well of older popular music or older style popular music to inform his own popular music songwriting. So, um, you know, if you do a harmonic analysis, trust me, <laughs> the beginning of these two songs are very similar. He's, and he, by his own admission, he's like, I took the chords from Comme d'habitude. I just did. <laughs> uh, so he was sampling in a sense, right? Um, this is a really vocally challenging and difficult song to sing. And one of the things that Bowie had done in the run up to recording the Hunky Dory is Again, he was really, he was always curious, always wanting to make himself better, always wanting to hone his art. He took voice lessons and he's like, I really want to expand the palette of what my voice can do. And you can really hear it paying off here. He keeps going up to this high B flat, which is really high in this range. And he keeps nailing it again and again and again. And he's done the song live repeatedly. And he just, he really, he really can sing this thing. Um, there's a lot of surrealist images here uh, in the song, um, whimsical lyrics, and also, um, you know, by Bowie's, Bowie's own framing of the song, he's like, it's about a self-sensitive young girl's reaction to the media. Um, and so again, it's in a way, it's kind of a story song, but as Bowie also said, it's a love song. Um, he wrote this after this girlfriend that he'd really, it was kind of his first big uh, girlfriend that he loved, um, this woman named Hermione Farthingale. I mean, what a name, <laughs> but he really loved her and she broke up with him and dumped him. And so this song is, is kind of sad Bowie um, thinking about her. And so there's a little bit of this girlfriend who left him in this song as well. This was a commercial success for him, mo more in the UK than in the US, but it, it really did break through, especially after he started getting uh, some uh, traction with his Ziggy Stardust uh, persona. And when he made this music video, it was a Ziggy Stardust, um, even though that persona really didn't exist yet when he um, made this album. And so it's kind of a perfect marrying of Ziggy Stardust, who is this, bisexual alien rock star um, and the subject matter of this song. So I'm just going to play a little bit of it for you. Okay. Um, Bowie for years and years and years, <laughs> he'd wanted to make a musical. He wanted to do a Ziggy Stardust musical and he wanted to do uh, a Diamond Dogs musical that was supposed to be a music theater piece. He kind of did it on the Glass Spider tour and people like hated him for it. Um, but 
one of the last things he did in his life in 2016 was he did a musical. <laughs> so he finally got there. He did the musical Lazarus in 2016. It was a jukebox musical and it was deeply, deeply strange. I saw it um, and trust me, it was very strange and very much Bowie. Um, and this song was a centerpiece um, in, that, in that musical. Um, I'm going to leave it there because I want to give us some time for questions, but thank you so much for being here and listening. Um, and again, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have about David Bowie because he is, if you couldn't tell, he's sort of an obsession of mine. I love him. <laughs> so I'm happy to talk about him. Uh, do you do any more courses like this? Do we te teach any more courses like David Bowie? So I have a class I teach on the Beatles. Um, there's also um, my colleague, Theo Cataphoris. Um, he is a popular music and rock specialist. He teaches courses on indie rock. Um, uh, we have another faculty member, Ruth Opara, who teaches classes on hip hop and music of the Black Atlantic. So we have a really robust roster of popular music courses in the department. It's one of our strongest areas. Excellent, thank you. Yep. Anyone else? Yeah, I have a question. I was wondering if you could maybe expand more about his different personas and what maybe inspired him to take on these personas. I find like that's just so interesting, especially even like talking about like the Beatles and everything as well and like Sgt. Peppers and everything. Like I find like when artists do that, it's just so fascinating to, and yeah. also really into psychology too. So like kind of like analyzing them from that lens. Um, yeah. yeah. Well I, I, I've done a lot of thinking about why Bowie does what he does. Um, so I'll give you two answers. One was it was part of a larger impulse. So this was the era of postmodernism. And so, and it, we're still in that era really. Um, so there was this kind of idea that you want to kind of rather, you don't necessarily need to be yourself. Why not be something else? And then by being something else, it can afford you all of these other possibilities. like. Think about something like the Beatles' White Album. It's exploring all different kinds of musical styles from avant-garde classical with Revolution Number no. 9 um, to music hall to um, uh, you know, heavy metal like Helter Skelter. If it, one of the things that's characteristic of postmodernism is a wide variety of styles all mashed together. And Bowie totally does that. I mean, as you could see, he's drawing them previous popular music styles. He's also mashing all these different influences together, mashing together elements of classical music with popular music styles, um, just the stylistic diversity. With Bowie though, there was another reason why he did this. Um, first and foremost, he thought of himself as an actor um, and kind of and as a performance artist rather than a rock star. He never really thought of himself a rock star as a rock star, although that's what he became. The rock star was just a persona that he played. Bowie himself, um, he had a lot of, per his own admission, he had a lot of difficulty with social interactions and playing a part or playing someone else on stage was very freeing for him. He didn't really, he was not ever really himself on stage, he says, until like the 2000s. And that was after a, he did a lot of work to try to work on the social skills piece of himself um, so he could have closer relationships with people. And he also, um, he also was, you know, he was able uh, to be more himself on stage uh, later in his life as he grew kind of older and more content in various ways. But when he was a younger performer, there was a real safety in performing as someone else and developing these other characters and not being himself on stage. He preferred to play a role than to be himself. Um, and I think that that, and this is just saying what he said and also what some of his collaborators have observed about him. Uh, if you ever wanna read something, read what Tony Visconti has to say about the recording of the man uh, who sold the world. It was not a happy <laughs> experience because um, Bowie was very depressed and was very kind of uh, non-communicative with his collaborators because um, he was really going through some things. So, um, 
you know, I think that, that Bowie, per his own admission, used a variety of masks to cope with the world. That's awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> They're both awesome, <laughs> which is better. Don't make me choose <laughs> him singing about how Ricky Gervais is a little piggy or whatever he says to him. <laughs> <laughs> or Zoolander. I don't know. The Zoolander one's pretty great. <laughs> They're both good, though. Bowie really was hilarious. He had such a great sense of humor. He was so funny. And I think that's one of the things that gave critics pause about him was because a lot of what he did, he didn't take a lot of this stuff too seriously. If you see him performing, even in his most rock star persona, Ziggy Stardust, he's often smiling. He's which is not something that, you know, a Mick Jagger would do. They look pretty hard, you know, Mick Jagger is like hard edged, but Bowie always looks like he's having an awesome time. <laughs> he's having a great time and that he's kind of winking at you too. He's like, yeah, I know. <laughs> Other things? Oh, I had a question. Sure. Um, so I was just wondering, do you think that Bowie is sort of openness with the fluidity of his sexuality sort of changed the landscape of like you know rock music at the time sort of like having a rock musician be so open about not being straight yeah um that's a great question so I've done a lot of thinking about this one as well and I think that we do have to give mm, it's a really complicated situation with Bowie so I think it's really easy to say that he was experimenting with gender and there was a lot of gender fluidity. And he certainly was sleeping with both men and women. Um, and, and he came out, first he came out as gay um, in, the, in the early seventies and said he was gay in this, in this gay magazine called Jeremy, which was circulating at the time. And that was incredibly brave because if you think about it, um, the laws again, it was illegal to be gay in Great Britain until 1968. Right. And so this was just the early 70s, a few years on from that. He could have gone to jail just a few years before. And then, you know, in that time, he's saying, hey, I'm gay. And it's on the cover of this magazine. Then he be, then he's like, well, not, I'm not actually gay. I'm bisexual. And then he got married. He got married to this uh, woman, Angie Bowie, who was his wife for a while and was also a collaborator, came up with some of his costumes. That marriage did not go well, though. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Um, they, ended, they did have a son, but then they ended up breaking up. Um, and uh, Bowie then later in his life, uh, and I do think, though, that he opened the door for other rock stars to then be more open. Then there were several other rock stars who came out and um, like Elton John and said that he was bisexual, which he then later came out as being gay. Um, but in the 80s, Bowie's legacy around this is a little bit complicated because in the 1980s during the AIDS crisis, he walked it back and there was a cover of Rolling Stone where he, it says straight time. And he basically is like, oh, I'm not, I wasn't really bisexual. I'm, 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 I'm kind of a closet heterosexual. And in part, he did that because at the time during the AIDS crisis, I mean, this is me piecing things together they weren't granting visas to performers who were openly gay or who were even bisexual because there was a real panic around uh, um, gay men uh, and, and the AIDS crisis. So he was worried about his career. There was a real uptick in homophobia at that time. And so he kind of walked it all back when, it, when he was worried about like his own career. So at that point, he wasn't so brave, right? <laughs> um, and then later in his life, he said again, he's like, well, yeah, you know, I just got tired of talking about my bisexuality. I really got tired of doing that. And especially in America, that's all they were interested in. Um, and I got sick of it. And so um, he kind of came around to another position later in his life. But he went on this journey with it. And especially at a time when the gay community could have used some support maybe, um, he wasn't totally there. So I think we have to acknowledge Bowie's complicated legacy. But on the other hand, the early 80s was a super, and early mid 80s was a super scary time with the HIV AIDS epidemic. And, and also 
you know, his livelihood was, was at stake. So, you know, I, but I do have to point out the complexity of his record around these things. Well, thank you so I much. Think, I do think he pushed the ball forward considerably though. And I think a lot of uh, LGBTQ plus people really view Bowie as having a profound impact on them and their art um, and has made a space for a certain kind of expression that wasn't there before. So I think we have to give him credit, but also we have to acknowledge the places where, um, you know, it maybe was, he has a more complicated record. Other questions? Well, my advice to you all is to go and seek out more Bowie content. And I will say this, the Victoria and Albert Museum in England, if you ever like make your way there, they now have the Bowie archives because Bowie, Bowie's a massive nerd. He loved the idea of people studying him and deconstructing him. <laughs> like, so unlike the Beatles who want to monetize everything to this day in their estates, his estate just like gave it all for researchers. They're like, here, go and look, here's all of my stuff, go and do it, go and go into my archive. So what am I going to go do this summer? <laughs> I'm going to go to the archives <laughs> as soon as I can to, to dig around in his stuff. Um, yeah, because why not do that? <laughs> Anything else? All right. Well, thanks, guys, for being here. I appreciate it. And um, yeah, hope to see you at Syracuse. All right, take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, thank you. Bye.